Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar, Elder Law or Protecting Your Loved Ones. My name is Kelly Blount, and I'm the Program Marketing Specialist here at General Electric Credit Union. We're so glad you've joined us as we have a lot of great content ahead. Thanks to technology, we're excited to be able to connect with you on such a great topic and wanted to thank you all for tuning in from the comfort of your home, work, or wherever you may be today. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to today's speaker, Jennifer Anstat, with Wood and Lamping to introduce herself and take us through today's topic. My name is Jennifer Anstat, and I am an attorney in Cincinnati. I practice primarily in the area of elder law. And so what that means really is I do a lot of estate planning and I do a lot of benefits planning. And by benefits planning, I mean I work with um, people who may have a spouse or a mom or a dad or some family member who needs long-term care. So I do a little bit more than just your traditional estate planner does. So that's really elder law attorneys are estate planners, they're benefits planners. We wear a lot of different hats that maybe your traditional estate planning attorney um, doesn't. So today we're going to talk about a few of the issues that come up a lot in my practice when I'm dealing with um, our elderly clients or clients who may need um, some additional help with their health. And so the first topic that I want to jump right into is estate planning. So when I have a new client who comes to my office, they may have questions regarding how to pay long for long-term care, maybe not, maybe they do just wanna make sure they have all their ducks in a row if anything happens and they're not able to make their own decisions. So the first thing we'll go into normally at our meetings is estate planning. And normally people come in and they've heard that they need to avoid probate. And so a lot of what we do is focus on how to transfer resources without having to go to court. So what probate means is you're going to the court and you're asking the court to distribute your assets according to your wishes. But we can avoid that altogether by using a trust or using beneficiary designations. There's a lot of ways that we can avoid having to go to court and probating a will. So the first thing that we ask when people come in to talk about their estate planning is what are your assets? Because we want to make sure that each asset goes where you want it to go. And the only way to know that is to figure out what type of asset it is. So, for example, if you have a house, your house has a deed, and we need to make sure that the deed is, prop, is in the proper name, and we need to figure out what's going to happen to that property when you die. Sometimes, if a deed is in your name alone and you pass away, we have to open a probate estate to have the court order that house transferred to either your heirs or whoever you've named in your will. However, there's also what's called a transfer on death designation, which is just a form that you fill out and you record with your deed. And it actually tells the recorder's office that when you pass away, you want your the ownership of your home to go to whoever is listed on that form. So often I'll have um, someone who comes in, they own their home, and they want to make sure when they die that their home transfers to their children. So sometimes we won't do anything. When they pass away, we'll go to the probate court with their will, and the court will order their assets to be distributed according to their will to their children. Sometimes, though, we'll add what's called a transfer on death designation affidavit to the deed. So that when they die, the recorder's office knows that the children are the beneficiaries. And that's very simple um, and it avoids probate altogether. 
sometimes we recommend that our clients transfer their assets into a trust. There are a lot of reasons why you might want to trust. One of them, and the most basic reason you might want to trust, is simply to avoid probate, so avoiding going to court. So we might transfer ownership of your home from yourself to the trustee of a trust so that when you die, the trustee then has the authority to distribute the house, sell the house, do whatever it is you wanted, make sure the house goes to your kids, whatever you put into that trust. Um, when we are doing this, this is what we're looking at. So we're looking at whether the assets are in the deceased person's name only, and we have to do probate, or whether they have transferred their assets to a trust, in which case we can avoid probate, whether their assets are titled jointly with right of survivorship, whether they have designated a beneficiary and that those beneficiaries either if you have an ira or a 401k you would designate a beneficiary if you have a bank account you would have a pay on death beneficiary if you have a house you might add a transfer on death beneficiary so they're different assets they call the beneficiary slightly different things but all of those beneficiaries are there to avoid probate so that's the first thing that we look at in the meeting, and then we figure out what we want to do. So one of the things that we talk to people about is how, you know, the difference between probate and non-probate, and really it's just a matter of time. So probate is usually longer than non-probate. So if you have a non-probate asset with a beneficiary, so for example, if you have your child listed as a beneficiary of your life insurance policy when you pass away they just call the life insurance company fill out the life insurance company's paperwork and claim the proceeds if that same life insurance policy doesn't have a beneficiary designation we have to open a probate case that's going to take longer for your heirs to get their money because it does have to go through the court there, you, you would normally hire an attorney. You might also have to pay your executor and there will be court costs. And actually, I think this court cost is kind of low. It probably is gonna cost more than $200 in court costs. So avoiding probate, whether that's through a trust or through beneficiary designations, is going to be faster and cheaper for your heirs. However, it could be that if you have to, if you if you decide to to draft a trust, it might be a little bit more expensive for you up front than simply naming beneficiary designations. However, it probably is still going to be cheaper than going through the probate process. So I think too, one of our goals is not only to just make things easier for your beneficiaries, although that's a big reason why we like to check on beneficiary designations or transfer assets to trust. I think the other thing we wanna do is really make sure that your assets are going where you think they are. And I hope that a lot of this that I'm talking about today is, um, sort of you guys already know it and I'm boring you a little bit um, but it's real I think these are really important concepts that not not everybody understands so here is an example of an estate so mom passes away and she's got a will and she's got some beneficiary designations so her house when she passes away is in her name alone so we have to take her will to the probate court and probate the will and the court is going to order us to transfer the house to her son and daughter so according to the will she wants everything in her estate distributed 
one half to son and one half to daughter. She also has a checking account that's held jointly with her daughter. She has a CD that's held jointly with her daughter. So rather than making her daughter and son the beneficiary of those two accounts, she's retitled her accounts with her daughter as a joint owner. And then finally, she has an IRA and she's designated her son and daughter both as 50% beneficiaries. So her total estate we see is worth $300,000. And her will says that she wants to leave her assets equally to her son and daughter. So we would, we would expect the son to receive $150,000 and the daughter to receive $150,000. But that's not what is gonna happen. So the house and the IRA will go 50-50. So the son and daughter will each receive $100,000, half of the value of the house and half of the value of the IRA. However, the daughter will get an extra $100,000 because she's the joint owner of the checking account and the CD. So daughter in this instance will actually receive 200,000 while son only will receive 100,000. And that may or may not be what mom actually wanted. So mom may have decided to do that on purpose, but it could have just been an oversight. So that's why when you're planning, it's really important to go through all of your assets and make sure they're titled correctly first to avoid probate and second to make sure those assets go where you want them to go so if you go to see an attorney that's where they're going to start talking about now again there's several ways to accomplish this one way is to simply update beneficiary designations. Another is to rely on a will, so you wouldn't have any beneficiaries designated on your accounts. And another way is to sign a trust. I like trusts. They're a lot more flexible than beneficiary designations, so you can have terms in there. For example, if you have a child who passes away, you can have language in your trust protecting money for grandchildren. Um, you can put, you know, sort of strings attached on money so it stays in trust after you pass away for a term of years, for example. So there's a lot of things we can do with trust that we can't do simply with a beneficiary designation. So that's sort of what you're going to do with an attorney if you go in to work on your estate planning. And that's really focusing on what happens after your death. But they're also going to talk to you a little bit about what happens while you're living. So there are also some estate planning documents that you need while you're alive. So one thing that we want to talk to you about is what happens if you're not able to make your own decisions while you're alive. And so most people think, well, I'll just have my spouse or my daughter or my son make my decisions, but they're not legally able to make decisions for you. So once you turn age 18, no one else has the legal authority to make financial decisions or healthcare decisions on your behalf unless you give them authority. If you've not given anyone the authority to make your decisions and you're no longer able to make your decisions, in Ohio, you can apply for a guardianship. So you, as guardian, would go to the probate court and apply to be guardian of an incompetent person called a ward. And incompetency is defined here, but essentially it, it really just means they can't take care of their themselves or their property. 
And there are two types of guardianships. There's a guardianship of the person. So in that instance, the guardian would have the authority to make health care decisions on behalf of the incapacitated person. And there's guardian of the estate. They have the ability to make financial decisions on behalf of the incapacitated individual. It's very common for there to be a guardianship of the person, but not of the estate. It's also common for you to have to have both person and estate. Now, there's other types of guardianships. There's limited guardianships where maybe you just have permission from the probate court to do one specific act on behalf of the ward. There are emergency guardianships. If th this normally comes up where there's a healthcare decision that needs to be made sooner rather than later. There's also something called a conservatorship in Ohio, but that's really if you're physically infirm but mentally competent and you ask someone to come in and help you. So it's a little bit different than a guardianship and those are pretty rare. You may have heard about Britney Spears in California, how she had a conservatorship. And that's what in Ohio we call guardian of the person in the state. So it's a little bit different depending on what your state you're in. But in Ohio, we have guardianships of the person, guardianship of the estate, and also a different animal called a conservatorship. If at all possible, we don't want to have to do this. So if you have a loved one who has not planned in advance, then someone will need to apply to be guardian. There will be a hearing at the probate court. The probate court will find that the potential ward is incapacitated or incompetent, unable to make their own decisions, and then they will decide who the best guardian would be. So there are some advantages to guardianships. Uh, often we see this where, um, most often, I'd say 90% of the time, you're gonna see this where there hasn't been any advanced planning. So no one has thought about this. And then we also unfortunately see this where maybe the family is having some sort of dispute or maybe ward is we're having trouble controlling the ward that that doesn't sound good that's not really the right way to say it maybe the ward refuses to leave a dangerous situation so a lot of times this comes up where we've got someone who's who's maybe a hoarder and they're living in a hoard and we need to remove them from that situation um Sometimes we have a ward who is being taken advantage of financially by um, a trusted person. The disadvantages of a guardianship is you do have to hire an attorney to help you apply. So it is time consuming and expensive. You do have to notify the ward that they are um, that there has been an application filed to have them adjudicated incompetent and appoint a guardian. So depending on your ward, that, that's probably gonna be fairly traumatic. They also have the right, the ward has the right to hire their own attorney and to be at the hearing. And finally, you have to have permission from the probate court to act on behalf of your ward. And the probate court might be more restrictive than you want them to be. So they may not say yes to all the things that you ask for. So there are several alternatives to guardianship, which if you have a choice um, are almost always preferable than a guardianship application. The first is if we want to take care of someone's assets 
and they're when they're not no longer able to a trust is the perfect vehicle to do that so you can think about a trust like a little corporation that you set up for yourself so for example i have a trust and if something happens to me and i'm not able to make my financial dis decisions then i have already named a successor trustee to take over for me and once she takes over for me she's making all my financial decisions for me but she has to act in my best interest so trusts are wonderful to help manage people's assets when they're no longer able to. The other thing that you can do is sign a durable power of attorney. So these are also wonderful. What you do is you, you as principal sign a power of attorney, giving your agent or attorney in fact, the ability to make your financial decisions for you. There's all types of different powers of attorney, all different types of language, but what they all do is appoint someone to act if you're no longer able to. Um, and then finally, we're gonna have three slides on this. You, you need to appoint somebody to make your healthcare decisions. And so there's, there's a, a couple different documents you might wanna consider signing. The first is a healthcare power of attorney. And again, you give an agent the ability to make your healthcare decisions for you. These are wonderful documents. In Ohio, we have a state form that almost everybody uses, which is free and pretty, um, you know, you can figure out how to fill it out and sign it. It is a little bit tricky it does take some time to read through it it's a fairly long document but it is very comprehensive and very good the healthcare power of attorney again appoints an agent to make your healthcare decisions for you you can also sign a second document called a living will and a living will is different from a healthcare power of attorney in that you are telling the world that you do not want to be kept alive if you're terminally ill or permanently unconscious. So essentially what you're telling the world is, look, I don't want to be kept alive if I'm permanently unconscious or at the very, very, very end of my life with a terminal illness. Instead, I want hospice care, essentially is what you're saying. You don't want to be kept alive by extraordinary means. So normally people will sign a healthcare power of attorney along with a living will, but it's not necessary. Everybody should sign a healthcare power of attorney, but not everyone will want to sign a living will. And then finally, there is what's called a declaration for mental health treatment. It's also a state form. If you have, um, if you have mental health issues, especially if you've got significant mental health issues, you might want to consider signing this declaration of mental health treatment, which goes into a lot more detail, specifically about mental health treatment than just a plain old durable power of attorney for health care. Um, we don't see too many of these being signed. Um, they're pretty rare. Um, I encourage all my clients to sign a healthcare power of attorney. There's a much more limited number of people that we would encourage to sign this declaration for mental health treatment because quite frankly, not everybody needs that. But if you do have some significant mental health issues, you might want to review that form. So if you don't take anything else from this today, um, what I really would encourage you to remember is to get a healthcare power of attorney and a financial power of attorney. Because those documents, since they're good while you're alive, will really make it easier for your agent to take care of you if you're not able to take care of yourself. You know, if you pass away, we can figure out how to distribute your assets. 
They may not exactly go where you wanted, wanted them to, but we can always figure it out. But if you're living and you don't have anybody to take care of you, then that's really going to impact you. So again, we, we recommend that everyone age 18 or above fill out that paperwork. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears the next. So, so when, when I have people come into my office, their estate planning is what we normally talk about first. And then we'll switch gears a little bit. And if they are wondering about how to pay for long-term care, we'll move into Medicaid planning. So there's three ways to pay for long-term care. And what I mean by that is if you can no longer live at home or if you can only live at home with a lot of help, then you're going to need some way to either pay your help or move into an assisted living or a skilled nursing facility. And these services can be paid for through a long-term care insurance policy, which almost no one has through private pay, and it's very expensive, or through the Medicaid program. Medicaid is a joint federal state program that helps people with low income and low resources pay for their long-term care. There's all sorts of different kinds of Medicaid, but that's the type we're gonna talk about today. So we're not gonna talk about if you're disabled and you're living in the community, or if you're a child and you're born with developmental disabilities, or if you're pregnant or nursing or have certain types of cancer. There's, there's programs out there for Medicaid for, for many different people. The type of Medicaid we're gonna talk about today is specifically for people who need long-term care. So there are two financial criteria to become eligible for Medicaid. You have to look at your assets as either income or assets, resources. So an income is like a monthly income stream, say your social security payment or a pension or, um, anything that comes in every month and you and, and it's it's sort of not because you've been to work it does not include interest or dividends or things that aren't strictly coming in to you because of maybe a prior job then you have to look at your assets and assets are things that you can sell to pay for your care so if you have cash in a bank account, stocks, bonds, things like that. So the first thing Medicaid is going to do is look at your income versus your assets. Assets include pretty much anything that you can cash out, including life insurance policies. I'm going to put a little asterisk by retirement accounts. Um, but pretty much anything that you could use to pay for your care is going to be fair game. There are some assets that Medicaid does not take into consideration when they're trying to figure out if you're eligible for Medicaid. The first thing they don't worry about is your personal property, your household goods. So there is a rule that says they're not going to pay any attention to your pots and pans and furniture and things like that. It's just simply too hard to figure out how much those assets are worth. One car is exempt. Term life insurance, because you can't get any money for it, that's exempt. Prepaid funeral plans and cemetery lots are exempt. And your house will be exempt, most commonly because your spouse lives there, but there are a few other exceptions. Now, if you're married, the rules work a little differently than if you're single. If you're single, you can only have $2,000 or less in resources, plus your exempt assets. If you're married, however, 
Medicaid is going to go down through a list of your assets, figure out what's countable. So remember the house doesn't count, a car doesn't count, term life insurance doesn't count. And you're, you will be eligible when you and your spouse have spent down one half of your resources, but the most you are ever allowed to keep in 2022 is $137,400. $137, so if you start out with a million dollars, you can't keep half of it. You can only keep $137,400. On the other end of the spectrum, you're never required to spend down less than $27,480. So here's how this would work. Medicaid is going to look at your resources on the day you became institutionalized. So let's say my husband went into the nursing home on January 1st. Medicaid is going to add up all of my resources, all of my husband's resources, and all of our joint resources. And let's say that all of our countable resources, so again, not including the home or car or prepaid funeral plans. <clears throat> We are going to be eligible for Medicaid, or my husband is going to be eligible for Medicaid when we have spent down half of those resources. So let's say that my countable resources end up being $200,000. My husband would be eligible for Medicaid the month that we have spent down to $100,000 or less. Because remember, I get to keep 100,000 or half of our total resources on the date of institutionalization. My husband gets to keep another $2,000. Now, let's say we started out with 300,000 on the date of institutionalization. Do I get to keep 150? No. I can only keep $137,400 because that is the maximum amount. So that's that's actually, I think, a pretty hard concept. So, so remember, you, you value your assets on the day your spouse goes into the nursing home. And he would be eligible for Medicaid when you've spent down one half of those resources but the most you're ever, ever able to keep is 137,000. So that's how that works. Now, when I have people who come into my office, they have a lot of different goals, but normally the, these, are, these are mainly what people want. So they want good quality of care for their loved one. So I rarely have anybody who comes in and says, hey, um, you know, I want to find the cheapest, worst nursing home I can. No, they never say that. They always want good care for their family member. They also are really worried about what's going to happen to the spouse in the community. So what's going to happen to me if my husband goes into the nursing home? We also have a lot of people who are taking care of disabled children. And we have clients who are very concerned about what's going to happen to my disabled child. We don't get very often, I want to preserve inheritance for my children. So if we've got a couple, we normally, that is sort of put on the back burner. Although that is one reason why a lot of people come in. So what do we tell people? If, if, if my husband needs to go into a nursing home, what do I do? So there's three general ways we can look at this. We can plan using three different types of planning, exemption planning, annuities, and transfer planning. The easiest way to spend down for Medicaid is through exemption planning. And that just means we're gonna buy things that are exempt. We're gonna purchase our prepaid funeral plans, our cemetery lots. We're going to buy a new car, we're going to buy a new house, or we're going to make home repairs, we're going to pay off all our debt. So we're going to do things to make this community spouse's life easier. 
So that's really the easiest, most basic way to, to, to become eligible for Medicaid. One thing now um, that we can do is also purchase an annuity. If you'll remember, we looked at an income test versus an asset test. As the community spouse, I get to keep all of my income, but the institutionalized spouse, my husband, has to pay for his care out of his income. So he pays his income to the nursing home and then Medicaid picks up the balance. So one thing we can do is take some of your excess resources and purchase an annuity. That is considered spending down, but if I, as a community spouse, purchase the annuity, then I get to keep all of that income. The annuity itself is exempt and only the income comes to me and Medicaid lets me keep all my income. So that's a wonderful way to spend down. So let's say you have $200,000 on your snapshot date. That's the date your husband goes into the institution and you know you have to spend down $100,000. One easy way to spend that down is to purchase an annuity for $100,000. Now, we used to use IRA money a lot to do this. We would annuitize an IRA. However, Medicaid has recently um, issued guidance that as long as you're receiving your minimum required distributions from an IRA, the entire IRA is exempt. So that's a really big deal if you've got an IRA or a 401k and you're receiving monthly distributions from it, the, the bulk of that asset, even though you can cash it out and use it to pay for care, what Medicaid is saying is you don't have to. It's an exempt resource. So we don't use annuities prop maybe as much as we used to just because a lot of people would annuitize their IRAs and now that's not required. As long as they're getting distributions monthly from the IRA, it should be exempt. So there could be a lot of you whose major assets are their home and an IRA in which case your the majority of your assets might be exempt for Medicaid purposes anyway, and you might be eligible for Medicaid a lot sooner than you think. So the final planning option that people talk about most often, there's lots of little ways you can plan, but on the next slide, what a lot of people ask about is giving gifts. So, when you're spending down to become eligible for Medicaid, you can pretty much do whatever you want, except give your money away. Just give it. There are some exceptions to this. You can, for example, give your home to a sibling who has an equity interest in the home. That's more common than you might think. You can give your home to a child who is taking care of you for two years or more while living in that home. And you can transfer your assets to a blind or disabled individual. But other than that, really you're not able to give gifts without having a penalty. And what happens is Medicaid asks when you apply, have you given any gifts in the last five years? And if you say yes, there's a period of time where Medicaid will not pay for your care. So if, for example, let's say you've given away $100,000 within the last five years. So in January, you gave $100,000 away. Medicaid will divide $100,000 by $6,905. That's the average private pay rate of a nursing home in Cincinnati. And $100,000 divided by $6,905 is 14.48. So Medicaid will not pay for your care for 14.48 months, beginning the month you're otherwise eligible. So beginning the month when you're out of money, 
So if you're single, you have $2,000 or less. Or if, you've, if you're married, you've spent down one half of your resources, then they impose the penalty. So you don't wanna do that. If you're gonna give a gift, the best way to do it is to give the gift and wait five years in order to be eligible for Medicaid. So if you give the gift, you wait five years, then you apply for Medicaid, Medicaid doesn't even ask if you've given a gift. Now, what if you've given a gift and you can't wait five years? You're going to have to figure out how to pay for that care. So there's a couple ways to do it. If you have some additional money, you can purchase an annuity to pay for your care during the penalty period. That's one way. So remember, you can buy an annuity, all of your income has to go to your care. So let's say you have a 14 month penalty. You have to have enough money left over to purchase an annuity that would pay for your care during those 14 months. Or you can fund what's called a pooled Medicaid payback trust. These trusts are exempt for Medicaid purposes and they will pay for care while you're on Medicaid. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about, I, I wanna leave some time for questions. There are all kinds of trusts that you can fund if you have if you want to go on Medicaid and you have a child with a disability and you want to give them some money Medicaid does allow you to do that and there's all sorts of trusts you can leave your money in um, some of the trusts aren't available if you're going on Medicaid some of them are only available if you pass away in your estate plan but some of them are available while you're on Medicaid so don't forget that you don't have to necessarily um, disinherit a disabled child you can leave money to them in a trust and I think I was supposed to talk for 45 minutes and so Kelly do we want to open it up for questions Yes, thank you. We can go ahead and do the q and A. I I know I saw a couple in the chat and then we had some pre-submitted, so we can go ahead and get started with that. Perfect. Um, let's see, this first one is pretty specific um, and it's kind of long, so bear with me. It says, I'm a power of attorney for my companion. They have been living in a nursing home since October of 2021. He has a long-term care plan through Genworth. They are using this plan to pay for his nursing care and there's a lifetime maximum of 542,000 and that will only last a few years. If he lives out, uh, I'm sorry, if he outlives the maximum, will he need to dip into his assets to continue to pay for his care? After that, they will need Medicaid. How do you make that transition? That's a good, I mean, how to make the transition is a good question. I mean, there, so what I would say is, um, depending on the circumstances, obviously, if you have a, a spouse in the community, you're going to want to plan, make sure you're um, using all your exemptions, you know, make sure you're purchasing an annuity maybe for the, for the community spouse. If you're single, there's not as many planning options. You know, maybe you can do some gifting. Maybe there are some things, but yeah, in his instant, in his case, you know, if he outlives that long-term care plan, then he would have to start paying privately with his own resources. And then if those ran out, he would need to do a Medicaid application. So, you know, they might, you might want to see an attorney and figure out if there's any way that you can sort of rescue any of those funds or if there's anything you can do to make sure he's got, you know, for example, um, he could put some money away in a, in a trust for himself that he could use while he was on Medicaid. Those are called pooled Medicaid payback trusts and Medicaid is okay if you fund them. Um, the, the money can be used while you're on Medicaid for the extras that Medicaid doesn't pay for. And then when you pass away, anything left in the trust 
um, will go back to reimburse Medicaid. If there's money left over after that reimbursement, then it goes to your family. So there's, so, you know, it, it's a really specific question on what to do. It, it really depends on your family circumstances and how much money there is. But yes, I mean, you, you do have options other than just, you know, spending all your money, you know, spending all the long-term care money, then spending all your personal assets and then going on to Medicaid. So I would encourage, you know, people to, to reach out to an attorney to figure out what their specific options are. Thank you. One of the questions that just came in asked if I could go back to the last slide. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that um, in case anybody wants to take these notes down. Let's see. The next one, I believe, came through when you were talking about estate planning at the beginning. Um, it's asking, what if it's written, written in the will to split assets between both a son and a daughter? Okay, so let's say in your will, you you say I want everything to go 50-50, but the will only applies to assets that are subject to probate. So the only assets that the will is going, that it matters what your will says are assets in your name alone at death with no beneficiary. So for example, if you've named a beneficiary on an IRA, that is not subject to probate. So your will may say, I want my, my children to receive my assets 50-50, but the IRA company doesn't care about that. They've made a contract with you to give that money to whoever you've been designated as a beneficiary. So if you say, I want my kids to have my resources 50-50, but then you leave your IRA, to your surviving spouse or a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend or you know the queen of england then that's where the ira is going to send that money so you have to be really careful and make sure that your beneficiary designations are correct i hope that helps yes our next question is does exemption planning work for a widow new car or home so that's a, that's a good question. If you are single um, and you need in-home care, for example, there are some there is a Medicaid program that pays for in-home care, then yes, you might consider um, doing home improvements or purchasing a nicer home or a handicapped accessible home. You might consider purchasing a new car. If you're going into a nursing home and you need Medicaid, that I don't know that that benefits you. Um, when you pass away, if you still have ownership of those exempt assets, they are subject to what's called Medicaid estate recovery. And the Ohio Attorney General's office is able to collect, um, essentially be reimbursed from your estate for anything that the state of Ohio has paid on your behalf. So any healthcare expenses they pay, they can go back and put a lien on the house and collect once the house sells. So again, it's really specific per, you know, to the person, but um, in general, exemption planning is much easier if you're married. The next question says, I'm a healthcare power of attorney for my companion. His son is also a healthcare power of attorney. He does not communicate or show any interest in his father, and I've been making all healthcare decisions. Will this be a problem for me? You know, I don't know that it's a problem as long as you are authorized under the healthcare power of attorney to make decisions. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know that I. I I can't say that it won't be a problem for you if you, but you know, you just have to do your best. Um, the son can always come and complain later. There's nothing you can do to stop that. This next question, um, if there is a family trust, is that recorded and visible for public viewing? No, it is not. Normally that is not a document that you would record anywhere. 
This next question, when is it too late to try to get a power of attorney, guardianship, et cetera, if your parent already shows signs of dementia? So that's a good question because a lot of people think, oh my gosh, mom has been diagnosed with dementia. I can no longer get a power of attorney. And that's not true. So it's, it's, there's tests for each of these documents. It, is the person competent enough to sign a financial power of attorney? So you don't have to be at 100% in order to sign a financial power of attorney, but you do have to know who the objects of your bounty are. So you need to know who your family is and you need to know sort of the extent of your resources. So there is a test for how competent you have to be. Um, so in reality, if, if an attorney prepares a will or a trust or a financial power of attorney or a healthcare power of attorney, it's okay if, if there's some cognitive decline, um, as long as they can still understand what they're signing so that you don't have to be at a hundred percent. If the determination by the client and the attorney, okay, I don't think that my client has the capacity to sign these documents anymore, then at that point you would need to apply for a guardianship. It's never too late to apply for a guardianship. It's just if you need if you need authority to help someone um, and, and the attorney decides, gosh, I don't feel comfortable, having them sign these legal documents, then that's the appropriate time to go to the probate court and apply for guardianship. Thank you. We have time for a couple more questions. So if anybody on today's webinar has anything that you'd like asked, please go ahead and submit that and we will try to get to it in the few minutes we have remaining. This next question is, the house I grew up in has both my mother's name and my name on it. When we sell it, do I have any say in what happens to the profits or does it all go to the state? Well, I think that depends. I think that there's a lot of different options there. So I don't have enough information to really speak to that. So I think you would need to talk to an attorney. This next question, do I have to go to court to become my mother's guardian or can she just grant it to me? So, um you can't she can't grant a guardianship what she can do is she can sign a financial power of attorney and a health care power of attorney if she's still competent if she's not competent then you would go to the court and apply for a guardianship now there is also this conservatorship idea where the per the, the ward essentially is um um physically infirm but mentally sound so you know the preference would be hopefully mom still can sign a financial power of attorney and a health care power of attorney if not that's when it becomes important to go and apply for guardianship but if mom can you know if mom says oh i want you to be my guardian and you think she's able to make that decision it sounds like she's probably able to sign a financial power of attorney and it looks like this is our last question so we'll end on this one um, at what age should i consider calling an elder law attorney well that's yeah it, it really depends on your situation you know um, what i tell people is let's look at your estate plan and make sure that's in place everybody needs one of those and then we can kind of determine okay do you really need to worry about medicaid planning now what are your assets do you have a long-term care insurance policy that maybe is going to help you know if you have a family member if you have family members who have early onset dementia you might be a little bit more concerned that you're going to need care you might want to see an attorney a little bit earlier um you know, it's important to look into long-term care insurance when you're a little bit younger, because then you can still be eligible for it. Um, but what I tell people a lot is if you just want to meet with an attorney for an hour and sort of figure out what's going to happen if you need nursing care, that might take some pressure off. It might make you feel more comfortable with your situation. 
because a lot of people they don't really need much planning um, because either they'll easily be be on Medicaid or they have plenty of money that they will never need Medicaid. It's the kind of the people in the middle that get pinched a little bit. But I wouldn't say there's a specific age. I would just say it's if you're if you're worried about it, see an attorney and and just figure out what's going to happen. Awesome. Okay. Well, that is going to conclude our Q and A session for today. If anybody has any other questions or wants to reach out to Jennifer after today's session, her contact information is up on the screen if you'd like to take that down. So with that, thank you all so much for joining us today and we hope you have a great rest of your day.